Hello and welcome to Lab Talk. Uh, today is an exciting day. As you can see here beside me in the view, we have the, uh, the lab here and we're actually talking on this Lab Talk about the uh, qPCR systems. You can see here the Quant Studio 7 and the Quant Studio 5, uh, both uh, manufactured and sold by Thermo Fisher Scientific. And we are going to be talking about how to choose between qPCR and what you can see here now, the digital PCR system, which is called the uh, Quant Studio Absolute Q. So, um, and little little tip here, what you're seeing in the side of that is an automated system. We've now uh, launched the Quant Studio Q Auto Run. If you're interested in automation, we can always demo that for you when you're ready. So, uh, off to our topic today. So, Lab Talk is about tutorials that help you get the best performance out of our products in your lab. Today, again, we're talking about DPCR versus QPCR, and we have a treat for you today. We have uh, a Marsha Slater. Marsha is a senior technical specialist for real-time PCR and digital PCR. Uh, she's been at Thermo Fisher Scientific uh, for 27 years. And over those years, Marsha has held various technical roles with applied biosystems slash life technology slash Thermo Fisher Scientific, which is what we're known as today. Um, her passion is PCR, especially qPCR and dPCR, and she's trained many scientists uh, on these technologies over the years. She's even been awarded a patent for using qPCR for HLA typing in 2007. Prior to joining Applied Biosystems, she was a research scientist at the Shearing Plow Research Institute, which is now Merck in Kenilworth, New Jersey. She holds a BS from Penn State and an MS from Rutgers. Welcome, Marsha. We're really pleased to have you here today. All right, well, thank you so much. I'm, I'm really excited to be here and talk about my favorite things, which are anything having to do with PCR. With real-time PCR and digital PCR, the, the most common question I get is, which one should I use? What are these things? And how do I know which is the right one for my project? So let's start out with just a little bit of background because there might be some folks here who haven't used one of these or the other. So I'll start with real-time PCR. And you're seeing a, a little clip of some real-time PCR data in front of you. This is showing the increasing of fluorescence versus the cycles of PCR. So with real-time PCR, we're capturing all of this data throughout the entire course of the thermal cycling. And as the number of amplicons increase, you can increase the amount of fluorescent signal in the reaction. To make a measurement from this, we take what's called a CT value. That's a measurement in time or in cycles of when the signal comes up above the background noise. Now I'll show you that threshold in just a moment. So here you're seeing some real-time data that's uh, got two unknowns, those are in red and green, and then some standard, unknown, or standard known controls, those are in gray. So the threshold is when each of these curves crosses that threshold line, which it's supposed to be here, it's a horizontal line right around the value of two in this particular uh, data set. Once we have that CT value, we then compare it to the others on this same run. So real-time PCR is a relative measurement because we need to compare those CTs to the others that are on this run. A CT all by itself isn't meaningful. It's only in context of the others that it takes on meaning. Now, digital PCR is different. It gets us an absolute quantity. So what you're seeing here is raw data from digital PCR. Each of these little dots represents a different subreaction from the same sample mixture. So this whole block that you see in front of you is from a single sample. It was divided out into 20,000 subreactions or microchambers. Every time the target molecule is present, that microchamber will light up. If it's not present, it'll be dark. So we count up the number of positives and the number of negatives in order to get to that absolute copy number of the target molecule or molecules, in the case of this one, this one's a duplex, in the reaction. To analyze this data, we create what's called a one-dimensional plot, and that's what you see in front of you now. This image is to digital PCR what amplification curves are to real-time PCR. All of the microchambers that are positive for the signal are 
plotted high up on the plot, on the high up on the vertical axis. And here you can see those in blue. And all the ones that are negative are lower. Those are uh, a low level of fluorescence. So we count the negatives that are below that threshold, the positives that are above that threshold to get our absolute quantity. There's no comparison needed to any other sample. No standard curves, no reference. We can get that quantity straight from here. So when I think about how these two technologies compare with each other in the lab, I think of this graph and I know it's complex. So let me describe it quickly. On the vertical axis, you see the amount of precision in the reaction and it's being expressed in a confidence interval. So when you think about a confidence interval, you want that to be as tiny as you can possibly get. So the higher up on the vertical axis, the better. And then across the horizontal is the concentration of your target. And we're going from high concentration to low concentration. So with that, those axes in mind, let's start with the dashed line. So the dashed line that you see here is what's typical and theoretical for real-time PCR. So with real-time PCR, you have a huge dynamic range. You can see it's even going just like off the charts over on the right-hand side. You can put almost anything into real-time PCR and get an answer. And over the bulk of that range, you're going to have some really good precision. My graph almost makes it look like the precision isn't as, as good as it could be because it looks lower on the graph. But really, the bulk of that line is really, really nice precision. And that's why real-time PCR is so popular in the lab. But for those of you who've already done real-time PCR, you probably have experienced what happens when you get out and see, to CT values that are in the 30s. That's where your precision falls apart. If you had, for example, one molecule versus two molecules, that's a whole cycle difference in real-time PCR. That would be poor precision. And that's why you see that dashed line just diving down into the, into the horizontal axis. The precision just gets lost when we get out into those single digits of copies. Now, digital PCR is the asymmetric curve that you see over top of that. So it's got some significant differences from the real-time dash line. So first of all, there's some hard boundaries. If you look at the left-hand side in blue, that's what happens when every single one of those little micro chambers is positive. If every single one of them is positive, then the system is saturated. It's overloaded. I can't determine a quantity from that. And so you see at that that left-hand side in blue, the precision is down all the way to the bottom. I can't quantitate out there. And on the other side, on the right, where the red vertical line is, that's what happens when every single chamber is negative. There's nothing there. I, I can't quantify that either. But if I'm within those two boundaries, look what I can get for my precision. There's, there's two really good reasons to use digital PCR. And the first is I could potentially access that peak of precision. And that occurs around one to 1 1.6 target molecules on average in the reaction. And just as a, a little thing to give you an idea of how that looks, if about one third of the reactions are negative, you would have about one copy on average per chamber. So I can see there that I have this peak that's so high, qPCR doesn't even come close to that. So that's one of the big benefits of digital is to be able to get that really, really high statistical power. The other benefit is on that downslope going down towards the red. What you see there is while it is getting lower and lower, it's still a lot higher than qPCR. So if you're looking to quantify something that's on the lower side, Digital PCR can potentially give you more statistical power down there. So when I compare these two, digital PCR is a way to get an absolute quantity. Now, you just saw it has a narrower dynamic range, but within that range, it has some really excellent precision. I haven't talked about this yet, but digital PCR can potentially tolerate some efficiency problems. And the throughput for our digital PCR will range from low to fairly high, especially if you were to use the automated system that you just saw before I started talking. For real-time PCR, you can do a relative quantification. You can also do absolute quantification if you use an absolute standard curve. Real-time PCR has a really wide dynamic range. And over that range, it has, it has very good precision, not 
necessarily as high as digital, but it's still good. Um, it does generally require you to have uniform amplification efficiency. And the throughput for real-time PCR can go from low, but it can also go to extremely high with fully automated systems and 384-wall plates. But let me dig a little bit deeper into that efficiency that I mentioned a moment ago. So what you're seeing here, this is some old data, and this is good data. You're looking at the amount of fluorescence in the log scale on the vertical versus the cycles. In the exponential phase of amplification here, you can see that those curves are what I refer to as air quotes, generally parallel. That's what you wanna see with real-time PCR. That means if you make some minor tweaks in the position of that horizontal threshold bar, if you move it up and down a little bit, the differences will remain the same because those lines are parallel. That's what you need to have with real-time PCR. But what sometimes happens, sometimes a curve might not be generally parallel to the rest. So this is an example of some bad data. If you look at that curve where I put the arrow, that curve is crossing over the rest. Now, I don't have a threshold position here, but imagine if anywhere in where the other ones are nice and parallel, I move that curve up and down, that weird one would change in its difference relative to the others. That would be really bad news. That, that's why this is bad data and you shouldn't use this type of data for real-time PCR. Now, with digital PCR, the only thing we ask in each of those little subreactions is just, is it positive or negative? So if this had been a digital PCR reaction chamber, it would have been perfectly fine because it's still positive. So that's what makes digital PCR so tolerant of inhibitors or efficiency problems. We just need enough efficiency to produce a positive when the target is present. So some of the other considerations as you're trying to decide between real time and digital, Real time has a great limit of detection. You could potentially put a lot of volume into a real time reaction. You could do a hundred microliter one and boost your limit of detection a little bit. So limit of detection tends to favor real time PCR. Limit of quantification though, that favors digital PCR. Digital PCR has more statistical power at the low end to give you the better quantitation of low quantity targets. Um, some other things to be aware of, digital PCR quantifies the number of molecules. So even though you'll hear all of us say copies, it's, it's actually molecules. So if you were to have multiple amplicons on the same molecule that you wanted to quantify, you'd need to cut them apart in order to make sure that they are separate molecules. And then one other thing we're not going to cover today, but digital PCR is fantastic if you want to quantify single base changes or small insertions of deletions with high sensitivity. So let me just give you a few examples of, of how you might decide. So I'm going to start out with gene expression. For most gene expression studies, qPCR is a great tool. You should have enough statistical power to call two-fold differences and higher amongst your samples. If you're using one of those Quant Studio real-time PCR systems that you saw in the opening of our session, those have even better statistical power. They should be able to get you to at least 1.5-fold. So that's great. You can use uh, real-time data with delta-delta CT analysis tools or relative standard curves to do gene expression. Digital PCR will provide increased statistical power, especially if your expression differences could be less than twofold. Then you might wanna to go to digital. Another place where digital PCR can be a great tool is if you're playing around with those CT values that are out near 30 or higher. At that point with real-time PCR, you often don't have the statistical power to call differences. That's where digital PCR can come in and give you that power to get answers at those really low quantity levels. Another benefit of digital is the answers are in absolute copy numbers, which makes comparisons really simple and straightforward. Another example of, of how I might decide, you know, I was thinking what's going on in the world and we've all been through COVID. So what if you were testing for that? Well, 
a lot of the tests out there have been done with real-time PCR. You can do a high volume PCR, that'll give you great sensitivity. You'll have a huge dynamic range. You could go to high throughput and using 384 well plates if you wanted to see if that target was present. And if you wanted to put in other targets for quality control, you can multiplex. But if you multiplex with real-time PCR, it takes very careful optimization and verification to make sure it's working properly. Now, digital PCR, remember I said it's very tolerant of inhibitors. So if you go out into the popular press, you'll see that a lot of uh, municipalities are using digital PCR to test wastewater. So wastewater can tolerate those inhibitors, provided you they're not too bad, in that wastewater. It'll improve your limit of quantification if you're monitoring for changes in the amount. Like So if there's a certain baseline amount that's present, and there's an increase, if you're talking about things that are, that are very low amounts, digital PCR will give you the statistical power to call that there might be an increase or spiking in the amount of that target. Another benefit of digital is multiplexing is typically more straightforward with digital PCR, but it does require that all the targets be within that smaller dynamic range. Another great example of the comparison would be copy number variation. If you were doing a copy number variation experiment with germline material, where you might expect your number of copies of that segment to be somewhere between zero and four, real time is a great choice. You would compare your samples to a reference gene and then a reference sample, get great quantitation. And if you wanted to boost your throughput, you could use 3D4 well plates. Now, digital PCR is where I would go if I was looking at, say, a somatic copy number variation. In those situations, the answer might not be an integer like it should be with a germline mutation. So digital PCR will give you the statistical power and precision to call that exact number of copies that are present in that material. It can also resolve higher copy numbers. So if you start getting out to more than, say, four or five copies of that target, digital PCR will resol resolve those higher numbers of copies. You can also run a single sample all by itself. You don't need to have a reference sample. But keep in mind, digital PCR measures molecules. So if those copies are in tandem, that would mean your amplicons are all in the same molecule, you would need to cut those apart for the best quantitation. So with that, I hope those give you some great tips um, in order to make your choice. Just as a summary, digital PCR takes your material, it divides it out into thousands of microchambers to do your quantitation. And then in each of those little chambers, all we're just asking is, is it there or not there, positive or negative? It does have a narrower dynamic range than real-time PCR, but the payoff is that you have access to higher precision and statistical power. It's also tolerant of inhibitors. Real-time PCR allows you to compare the timing of amplification among signals. Real-time PCR gives you a very, very large dynamic range, and while not as good as digital PCR for statistical power, it's still really good, and it's capable of the highest throughput level of PCR. And just finally, there's really not a right or wrong choice. Each of these technologies can be utilized in, in many of these experimental types. It's just which is the one that will give you the, the best outcome, the best data for your particular project. So with that, I'll wrap up and give you a few resources. Um, so we have uh, pages at thermofisher.com where you can learn more about the absolute Q digital PCR and real-time PCR. I could point you to a web page and that is uh, thermofisher.com slash absolute Q. We'll take you straight to all of our digital PCR resources. And then finally, uh, we have a podcast that's out there called Absolute Genius. It's a lot of fun. So I'd invite you all to check it out. So thanks and I'll turn it back over to you, Angela. Um, otherwise, everyone have a great week and we'll see you next Thursday for, ooh, I don't have the topic handy, but you know what? It's going to be a good one. So Jeff, definitely join us. Thanks again, Marsha. Thank you. <laughs> Take care.